Hey y'all, welcome back to the Hack Shack. Today we've got a fun one. This is another radio related one since that seemed to be somewhat popular the last couple of times I've done one. The hand bugs bitten me back a little bit again. You know, back in uh, June, I think it was, I did the field day setup and then I had the hacker box that had the cool little VHF module and we did the fox hunting stuff with it. That was pretty cool. And that kind of got me back looking around at stuff again and the digital stuff kept popping up. And I can remember very clearly back in the day, 10 years ago or so, I just didn't have any real interest in this, that thing. I was real in my head at the time. I was like, if it requires infrastructure, then what's the point? That was, you know, and, you know, now I realize that's probably not exactly, you know, it's, it's not it's not exactly black and white. Of course, with digital modes, they could be local to a repeater. You can do simplex with them or the Internet linking stuff, which is pretty cool. I know I think I've kind of come around to liking it. So I was looking around and, you know, I've never spent a lot of money on a handheld. And from looking at prices and the systems and all, like many other folks have come to the conclusion of the DMR stuff looked like it was going to be the cheapest way for me to play with digital. And I know there are probably better. Well, I mean, we all know there are better quality radios than some of the ones out there that are on DMR. But price was a big thing. I didn't want to dump a lot of money in and maybe find out that I didn't like it and be stuck with something I'd have to get rid of. So. I've bought another Bofang, this time the DM1701. Like I said, I was looking around at, at things, and I kind of looked like DMR was the, ch the cheapest way to go to kind of dip my toes into things. So during Black Friday, and I'll show here, I picked up a DM1701. Um, it was just a little bit discounted, and I'd already opened it at this point as you look here, but I'm just going to show you what I was in here, and we'll go on to the next steps here. But uh, stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy this. Nothing too exciting here, but I just wanted to show you what was in the box, just in case you were wondering. I didn't see it somewhere else already, but I'm sure you could have. This radio has been out for a little bit. Got the manual in here and got some other bits and bobs. That was the bag the antenna was in. And here we've got the programming data cable. It's got the Kenwood style mic speaker connection and USB on the other end. Standard thing there, similar to what's on Bofangs and other radios. Here's a little earpiece mic doodad thing here. I don't know that I've ever used one of these, but uh, it's here if I want to try it out, I guess. Here's the AC adapter that plugs into this charger base here. And then we've got a wrist strap and a belt clip. That's about it. And oh my gosh, how could I forget to do this? Now, one thing I didn't mention that was also part of how I selected the radio I purchased was this Open GD77 firmware. Now this is a firmware that works on certain radios that are kind of in the same family. They may have different brand names and model numbers, but they all kind of share the same guts. And uh, folks have worked and made this kind of enhanced or better firmware that's kind of open source. And people seem to say pretty good things about it. So even really before even playing with this radio with its stock firmware, I sought out and wanted to find out how to install this firmware on the 1701. And again, that was one of the reasons that I selected the 1701 price and it being one of the ones that this could go on and when i searched around i found the github page that you are looking at here but it would appear that at some point the original author removed the github page so i guess the code up to a certain point was forked and it remains there to look at it historically but to get any of the new releases you basically have to go to this open gd77.com and even this link here kind of doesn't go anywhere you have to kind of take off the end that you know has says downloads there and just go to opengd77.com and it kind of brings up essentially like a forum site that you have to navigate through. Here you can see when I locate the DM1701 section of the forum and it's got a little uh, link right here right where it says you can get the firmware and there takes a link to a subdirectory that comes up with some stuff like this. And it's got the open dm 1701zip which i grabbed okay so the next thing i navigated to was this open gd77 cps software and that's the code plug software so that's like the software that you'll use to program the radio like with the code plug or you know all the frequencies and settings and things like that that you want as well as it's the same piece of software you use to actually push the firmware to the device and you can back up configs and push in pre-configured code plugs, all that kind of thing. So basically you just follow this here and pay attention to the note there where it says, as usual, the password is the version number, including the R. 
Seems like a lot of folks pop up asking about passwords, but that tells you right there what the password is. And after downloading and starting this installer for the CPS software, you got the password prompt there. And just like I said before, the password is that version number, just like I pointed to there. So just type that in as it says to and hit next. And it's just like your typical normal Windows software installation. Now, if you look here when it's done, it has these uh, two options kind of checked by default. One of them is to put the COM port driver on and one is to launch the CPS. Now, when it did the part to install the driver on my particular system here on the bench, it just kind of hung up. So I just had to kill that out. At this point, I got the radio on the bench here and opened the little flap on the right and plugged in the USB data cable and got that plugged in. And to get the radio into the mode where it'll take a firmware update, you have to have it off and turn it on while pressing the top button and the PTT button at the same time. So basically the top and middle button there while turning it on, we'll put it into that mode. If your LED is flashing like this, you're in the right mode. Now back over on the Workbench PC, we're gonna go back into the CPS software and I'm gonna go over here to radio type and select this bottom option because that's where the 1701 is. And then you'll see I'll go over to extras and firmware loader and that'll bring up the dialogue that we need to look at to do the firmware update on the device. Now you can see where I'm selecting the DM1701, then I have to select the firmware right here. And the firmware it's asking for here is kind of like an original firmware that I think, I guess the OpenGD77 patches or something or another. Uh, if I got that terminology wrong, just let me know down in the comments, but you need a copy of the real firmware to apply this to, to then be able to push to the radio. So I did not have that, so I had to look around. I'll save you the mess of looking at that but I'll put a link in the description to the one I use, but I basically looked for a MD9600 one, and that was fine actually to use as my donor firmware. And here you can see where I'm navigating to where I unzip that and I apply it and I get this message here that's saying that it's okay. And now the radio will have DMR functionality. I then use the other option to point at my open firmware, dug down, got that, but then I was greeted with this message after I tried to apply it. And I found this in the device manager where it looked like I needed a driver It might explain something I missed when I saw that driver install hang up earlier in the installation of the software. I then headed over to their Radiotity Bofung download support page and down there at the bottom they have the DM1701 and I downloaded this right here, the programming software and firmware, hoping there'd be a serial driver inside. And as luck would have it, I did find a serial driver in there and I pointed Windows to look in that specific directory to get the driver. And once I did that and said OK and stuff, it pops back up and looks like the driver worked and shows up normally, but a little bit lower there in the device manager now. Now that I had the correct driver, I was able to go back in the OpenGD77 code plug software and pick my files again and do the firmware update to the radio with no trouble at all. After pushing the firmware, I got the radio back out on the bench here, turned it on to see if it booted up okay. And you can see there it boots up and says OpenGD77. And I'm just messing around and I'll go through some of the menus here. And, you know, half of this stuff I still don't know what it does, but um, it was pretty cool. One thing about when you put this software on this particular radio, the 1701, the display in this one is, I think, shifted a little higher physically. So that makes the top line look kind of cut off. But if you lean it up, you can see it. Uh, I can live with that. I know that bothers some folks, but it's not a trivial thing to change from what I've read in the forums for the folks that develop the software. So that's okay with me. So I have my radio sorted out with the new firmware, but I didn't have any nearby repeaters. So I was going to have to get a hotspot. So I started doing the internet research that everybody else does. I was looking at videos and reading things. And I kept coming back to this video from Steve KM9G from Temporarily Offline Ham Radio. And this was something that just was seemed really easy to follow. Now I know this focuses on the WPSD setup and I know like that's some other things under the hood, but to me, this seemed like one little package. It was easy for me to follow. And I figured this would be a good way for me to get started. And if I become some kind of power user later, maybe I end up dealing with those things on my own and I can kind of customize things. But this seemed to be really easy for me to understand. 
and it gets lets me get the WPSD on the Brandmeister DMR network. So this is what I followed along with, and I highly recommend checking it out. It's really great. He does a good job in this. So after watching through his tutorial a couple of times, the next thing I did was went to radioid.net to register for an ID, and I will give you one quick tip here. The only license proof they'll take is one of these PDF official copies like this, or a photo of the real full-size license. I don't want a photo of the wallet size license or anything like that. So make sure you've got that in order before you go over there and start this process or you're gonna get frustrated. Now, once I had my DMR ID issued, I think it was about uh, the next day or so, I was able to take that over to brandmeister.network and register there using my call sign and the assigned DMR ID. And once I had that stuff ready to go, I was ready to focus on actually getting the hotspot going. And this is the hotspot I picked. I was going back and forth on trying to decide if I wanted the simplex or a duplex. And simplex, you know, is the red one with just one radio. Duplex is the one that's got two radios. And there are some things you can do with the duplex you can't with the simplex. The main thing to me was I kept reading where if you happen to get on one of the busier talk groups and you can't get in there with your key to chunk it, you can't really change frequencies. And I didn't want to be out in the backyard or something listening and then have something I couldn't get away from. So that was the first like easy reason for me to decide on duplex. And I believe there are some other things that I can take advantage of later with that. And uh, I'm looking forward to messing with that more, but that was the basic reason why I went with duplex initially. And I probably could have saved a few bucks by getting this from AliExpress or something like that. But based on what Steve had said a few times in some videos, I think he's had good luck with these R sequins. And it sounds like these folks maybe buy them in bulk and do some basic testing. And I don't mind repairing something, but I didn't want to have to deal with any extra headache potentially. And so that's why I got this R sequin from Amazon. So that came in from Amazon and here's a little shot of the unboxing. You can see what all it comes with. Looked pretty good, looked like what I ordered. The bad thing is though, I also ordered this, which is an orange pie, because I thought I read somewhere or heard someone say, hey, you can use an orange pie. And what I didn't do is I didn't read the fine print enough. This is the fine print that I did not read. This was 100% my fault, so I blame no one but myself for it. And as you can imagine, I fiddled with that image and it did not work, and it took me a minute to realize what I'd done. So I will spare you all those details. Once I realized my mistake, I went and dug up a Raspberry Pi 4 out of my stash of stuff, and then I went and got the Raspberry Pi image and put that on an SD card. And then I use this file to put the settings in for the Wi-Fi. that I'm not gonna show you what mine are, but this is the file. You put it in the right place. And then when the Raspberry Pi boots up, it will connect to your Wi-Fi. Then I put that SD card into the Raspberry Pi and put the hat on there for the hotspot. Then I fired it up and waited for it to boot and connect to the network. I wasn't sure what IP address it had initially, so I went and verified on my PFSense firewall. Once I got that, I was able to go over to the web interface and continue my configuration. I'm not gonna dig into all the details of my config. You can check out Steve's video that I'm gonna link in the description. That'll walk you through everything you need. So I went over and over my config, thought I had everything right, but I could never get it to fully come up all the way. And the screen on the hotspot never had that like basic status screen. And I finally found this when I looked in the logs. And just a reminder, if something's not acting right, always go and look in the logs. And you can see at some point I had upgraded the firmware first thing with this. And as part of that firmware update, it has a certain bit of code in there. So it won't let you set your frequencies to those that are conflicting with the satellite. What's, you know, the gentleman's agreement satellite frequencies or whatever. So that's what was happening there. I'm not even sure how I set that setting. But anyway, as soon as I corrected that, you can see here where it fired up the rest of the way. And then I saw the status that I expected to on the screen of the hotspot. Now with the hotspot sorted out, it was time to program the radio so we could give it a test. Now this is a, another video that is not for the same exact radio as mine, but the concepts were great in this one. And this is another one from Steve, KM9G. I just really like the way that he goes through the things here with the cards and how he explains it. I will put a link to this in the description. You might like it. And as we look at his software here, it wasn't exactly like mine. The concepts were pretty much the same. And I think I was able to take these and apply them to the software that I was gonna use. I'm just going to show you as I walk through some of the contacts and zone stuff and all. 
that I put into my code plug software, the OpenGD77 code plug software. Looks different than example from before, but this is, looks like it works okay, right? I mean, you can make sense of it. It's not too bad to figure out. Now I may have something that's not optimal done here, so I might need to fix it, but this right here is enough to kind of get me started to listen in and to try out the Parrot thing, which is kind of like, you know, like an echo test. So as soon as I get this done, I'll push the code to the radio and we'll try an echo test on the Parrot talk group. All right, now that we got the code plug in there, we'll show you the radio. I've got these uh, on the Parrot frequency here and we're gonna see if this works. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Seems like it works. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, if you got any tips or good talk groups or anything like that, uh, I'm all ears. Uh, throw it down in the comments below and maybe we can even set up and uh, have a conversation or something. Hey, the going. Uh, that'd be fun because I haven't really talked a bunch on it besides the parrot thing. I've listened a bunch, but uh, I have not had a real QSO yet. So I need to get, get that taken care of probably. So thanks for watching. Take care. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.